What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to MLS 5 Aside Week 4. Um, we got a lot of takes coming out of this first month of the season. Again, we stress it is still very early. Things can turn around very quickly. You look at Sporting Kansas City last year, winless in their first 10. They came on over the last two-thirds of the season and were one of the better teams in the league and upset St. Louis City in the playoffs the first round. There is still time for things to turn around for all teams, but for every S Kansas, uh, Sporting Kansas City, where they had a, a really great turnaround, for every 2016 Seattle Sounders who came on strong in the second half of the season, there's just a lot of bad teams that start bad go bad through the middle, and then finish bad the rest of the season. So there's plenty to dive into here. I'm trying to figure out what's real and what's fake. We're going to do a little buy or sell for this week's edition of MLS 5 Aside. All right, buy or sell, number one, Minnesota United, buy. Look, they're legit. This team is more talented than I thought. And, and like, again, I speak often about how good that I think Emmanuel Reynoso is and some of their other pieces. If you told me... At any point over the last three or four years, or however long it's been since Reynoso was established in this team, if they could go an extended period of time without Emmanuel Reynoso in the team and get points and look good while doing it, I'd be shocked. So the fact that Minnesota United have started the season the way that they have, and they won again this weekend at home against LAFC in Eric Ramsey's managerial debut, it was a team in transition this preseason, a front office in transition with Khaled El Hamad taking over, and Eric Ramsey, again, only doing, uh, starting his first game this weekend. Emmanuel Reynoso made a season debut. He still hasn't started. There have been Bongi Longway has been in and out or mostly out, right? This team has not nearly been full strength and they've looked really good so far. Look, it's a small sample size again, but the vision is taking hold. Kaudo Hamad took over and he wanted this team to morph into a more transition-based, a more up-tempo, a more youthful side than they have been in the past. Again, they were successful under Adrian Heath playing kind of a lower block and again, the game revolving around Emmanuel Reynoso, which you should do when you have Emmanuel Reynoso. But this new leadership came in, and Khaled El Hamad wanted to play a different system, a different style. I'll admit, I was a little bit dubious. And again, we still could be about whether or not Emmanuel Reynoso will look adequate off the ball in this. We know how good he is on the ball no matter what, right? But will their kind of transition style, will their, will their up-tempo or trying to press be taken away because of Reynoso being on the field. For me, I don't think so, because I think that they have a lot of ground coverers, a lot of piano carriers around Emmanuel Reynoso. Uh, Pookie looks very good. He looks much more mobile than I thought he was going to this year. Again, he, he might not have the, the elite top-end speed, but he's working really hard. He's really, really intelligent with his movement, and I think that's going to work out fine for them. Jong Sang-bin has leveled up this year. He's been legitimately very good, and it seems sustainable and repeatable these aren't like low qual like you know high variance actions like he's been very consistent so far this year again maybe it's just a really good month but for me like I think that Jong has leveled up so again the biggest concern moving forward for this team is whether or not they can integrate Reynoso get the most out of him while also still having the style can those two things coexist again I think that they can is Luciano Acosta an elite presser no he's not he does more against the ball than Reynoso does but what was it like the year before um, Pat Noonan took over in Cincy? I don't think, I think, again, he still probably covered a little bit more ground than Reynoso, but he definitely took it a step up against the ball. Reynoso has said the right things in preseason this, this year from the people that I've spoke to around the club. Again, as long as he's not a huge negative off the ball, this is going to work out for him because he's going to get the ball in higher spots up the field. He's going to get the ball hopefully in more space. What Cincy did with Luciano Acosta is the blueprint for what Minnesota want to do with Emmanuel Reynoso. They want him up the field. They want him in more dangerous positions more often. So the last system was heliocentric around Reynoso, but in a different way. This one can still be, even though a pressing system, you know, the press is supposed to be the, the best playmaker on the field. Well, when you have an elite playmaker, that helps too. So again, I think that this, if you're looking optimistic, you really can get even, you know, the best out of Reynoso still, even if it's not a system that, you know, maybe makes a ton of sense for him. Again, like there is the worry that it falls apart a little bit and they have some really difficult questions to answer about how to move forward. But for right now, I'm buying Minnesota United. Some stats pulled up by my man, Jeff Ruder of The Athletic. Um, it kind of shows what this team wants to be and how they're executing. They're 23rd in MLS in possession at 45.6%, but they're, 13, uh, they're 13th in MLS in field tilt. That just means that they're dictating where the game is played, though they don't have the ball. Think of, think of the Red Bulls. The game is dictated on their terms, and they give up possession, ball possession for field position. Their long pass share is second in MLS, 
Um, they, they're they still, though, 10th in shots. So when they're attacking, they're going direct. And they're still getting quality attacks without ponderous possession. So this is the identity shift that the club wanted to have. It's impressive that it's happened so soon, particularly with two interim coaches and now uh, your full-time head coach just getting here and the sporting director not getting here at the beginning of preseason, and all of the other things that, that I complained about during the preseason, all of the, the potential red flags, they've navigated it very, very well. It is very impressive what Minnesota United has done this season, and I am a true believer. I think this is real. I don't think this is a mirage. MLS 5 side number two, buy or sell. Sell LAFC as is, but LAFC long-term, hold that stock. Maybe even buy a little bit on the downswing. LAFC's creativity problems are very real, and it dates back to last year. They kill teams in transition. Teams know this. They kill teams on set pieces. Teams also know this. The best way to play against this team is to not give them transition opportunities and to try to limit their set pieces as best they can. And set pieces is a stat that varies for a lot of teams. Colorado Rapids is the best example of a team that is consistently towards the top of the league in set pieces, and maybe LAFC can do that as well. But if Buwanga isn't going supernova, and he's had some regression to the mean this year in terms of expected goals to goals. He outperformed his goal scored last year, but I think that was more of a quality thing than just, you know, a luck thing, right? But again, we'll see what happens this year. He hasn't scored yet. I think he'll be fine, but when he's not scoring and when they're not getting uh, a lot of numbers on set pieces, they're not winning games. So again, the worries are very real for this team. What I will say in the long term, DP spots are open. What happens if, if Vela comes back? What happens when they use that DP spot? Look at all of the signings that this club has made. They hit at a very high rate. I know that you know they were linked with Olivier Giroud. That's real. If you add Olivier Giroud to this team, I think the possession gets much better as well. I think the passing sequences get much better as well because he is a phenomenal hold-up play for a center forward. And oh yeah, if you're ever kind of stuck, screw it. Launch a long ball into his feet, into his body. Launch a cross towards him. Create some chaos. And again, he's phenomenal with the ball at his feet. But giving that aerial threat in addition to the elite transition ability of Denny Buwanga and the burgeoning transition ability from Kiki Oliveira, which, again, I think that there's more to come there, I think this team is going to be fine in the long term. But short term, without that new signing and without some some serious questions answered in terms of their build-up play and how they use the ball to break down teams, those issues are very real and they are not new. So I'm a little bit worried for LFC right now, but this is a team that has shown over the last few years they continue to reinvent themselves. I would love to see them do more with the ball, but even if they don't, if they find their form again in transition, maybe another player like Kike Oliveira starts overperforming his XG, or Danny Buanga gets back on track, or they score some set piece goals, whatever it is, I still think they're capable of that, but they do have questions to answer. That's why I would sell right now. Number three, we're going to lump two teams together because they just played an incredible game. LA Galaxy and St. Louis City, buying both. Um, that was such a fun, wild game. That was a classic MLS after dark. I love when there's early season games like that. That was just end to end, back and forth. Both teams trying to win. Both teams really going for it. Both teams trying to put their frame of how they want to play soccer on the game. It was just a delight for that to happen in mid-March during a typical MLS season. We'll start with the Galaxy. Why I'm buying the Galaxy? Joseph Pansil is among the best players in the league already. That's probably a bit of an overstatement after a month in, but his pedigree, his age profile, his skill profile, and athletic profile, all of those things tell you he should be one of the best players in the league. And the eye test has backed all of that up. The advanced stats back all of that up and everything else. So I don't think that it's a stretch to say we should be looking at him among the better players and among the best players in the league right now. Again, it could change. He could go out of form. Kaku looked like one of the best players in the league for the Red Bulls his first half season. And then he became pretty average as far as DPs go after that. Lukinas looked really good for the Red Bulls after two months. Sorry, these are just two examples that came to mind. Um, And then he was very bad for a DP after that. So again, it still could happen. Cover your bases here. But Pansil is legit. And that's what I'm operating under. Another player who's who's really performing well is Dejan Jovlic. His expected goals leads the non-penalty expected goals and, and just overall expected goals leads individual players in the league. This is the player that we thought we were going to see last year when he was, particularly when Chicharito was out. This is a player that we've seen in stretches off the bench in limited minutes, but hasn't quite had this form in starting minutes. I think he's going to score a ton of goals this year. Again, like if he's just average, he's going to score 15 goals, and I think he's going to be better than that. So the attack, again, Ricky Pooch, don't need to say anything more about him as I continue to do. That group is absolutely elite. It's one of the best in the league. 
the pieces fit and work next to each other. I've been saying this all offseason as well. It just makes sense. The players get the most out of those around them. The worry is they keep throwing away points at the beginning of this year, this weekend against St. Louis. They should have put this game away early. Early in the season, their, their debut against Miami, they should have put that game away early. I'm looking at this more as unlucky, random-ish moments than I am like last year's collapses were indicative of this team. It wasn't a bug, it was a feature, right? Their XG against per game is 1.2. That's not great, but it's middle of the pack in MLS. If this defense holds to be league average, they're going to get a ton of points, and they're going to be top four in the West. If this defense is slightly better than average, they're going to be challenging for the top spot in the West. But if it's disastrous, they're going to be fighting for a playoff spot. And that's where it comes down to, again, maybe Mikovic get, gets, a, gets a chance in goal for John McCarthy. Again, I think John McCarthy's fine. Jay Winnie will be back at some point from injury. Um, we'll see what happens now with Martin Caceres um, suspended. They're pretty thin at center back right now without Jay Winnie being available. But again, like Mickey Amane has been a really good, like again, it, it all makes a lot of sense. They're playing much more, much smarter than they were last year in terms of transition, defensive transition. So I really like what the Galaxy have shown. For St. Louis, they still dictate the game on their terms. I was worried about replacing Nico Giochini, but Sam Adenarin and AZ Jackson have been, between the two of them, very good kind of second bananas to Zhao Klaus. Again, like they could still use another... Max Tam or low DP type of option in that attack, which again, I know that they were looking for since that they've transferred away Joaquini. They've had, they've had some conversations with different players that I've reported before and, and some things that have trickled out. So they are in the market for that. Maybe they just hold that to the summer because they're fine right now, right? Berkey is insane. Like He was the best goal in the league last year. And le- this weekend, it was probably the best performance I've seen a goalkeeper who also gave up three goals. He was unreal. They should have conceded six easily. Like it was a phenomenal performance by by their goalkeeper. And again, for all the regression to the mean stuff, I generally believe in that. But there are exceptions. Berkey is special, so I'm going to expect him to overperform his expected shots against expected goals against. And as long as he's doing that, this team is going to be very good. Two more left, and we're going to end on a couple downturns, a couple pessimism. Number four, MLS five aside, FC Dallas, sell. Things do not look good. It's very disjointed. They struggle to turn, you know, ball control into game control. Their only win of the season came in the last minute against San Jose, and it wasn't really deserved. And San Jose have had a lot of problems to start the season as well. Dallas switched from their 3-4-2-1 to more of a 4-4-2-ish. Um, do we think that was for personnel, or is that a worry that the new system might not be solving the problems that, that they had last year? I think it's the former but not getting results is going to make the manager become much more kind of pragmatic because his job's going to be on the line if this continues, because these are not new problems. Dallas have are under just under one expected goal per game. That's 26 in MLS, but they're fourth in possession. It is the same thing as last year where they could control the ball, but it was ponderous possession. It went back and forth side to side. It was slow. It wasn't urgent. They weren't creating anything. They weren't creating anything until towards the end of the games when they would go four, four, two and just kind of be more direct. I know that they want to play with possession and break teams down to the ball. They're just not doing it. And they haven't done it over the last year and, and five games. Like I thought they were going to jump last year and they didn't. I thought that they were going to be better this year. You add a $10 million center forward into the group. That's supposed to change things. ER Mendy having a full season again. I know that he's, that he's kind of not been completely available. These are issues that are not new. And these are absolute red flags. Peter Musa has one expected goal in 270 minutes. That is the same as Kevin Cabral who has played 22 minutes this season. That is slightly better than Charlotte FC center back Adilson Melanda. This is a $10 million center forward. I think that Peter Musa is going to come good. I think that he's going to be fine. What I'm very worried about is chance creation for Peter Musa. It's it's similar to the Hugo Kuypers discussion that, that was bigger last week before he scored his first goal. Like, these players need service. All forwards need service. He's not getting it. They're not creating enough for him. And that's going to be the problem. And until they prove otherwise, there is a way bigger sample size that this is who FC Dallas are than this optimistic view we hope that they could be. Lastly, New England Revolution. Their dire start to the MLS regular season campaign has continued. Um, I'm just going to read off some Caleb Porter quotes because he was pretty fire in, in the press conference after they lost to FC Cincinnati. Quote, it's not good enough. First of all, I take responsibility. I'm the head coach. It's my job to pick the players, prepare the players, and win games. That hasn't happened. My favorite quote is that he was going at their mentality. Bottom line, we have to be better. 
We have to find guys who can be more consistent, who can perform in the way we need them to perform game in and game out, and have a stronger and tougher mentality both sides of the ball. That's the thing with this team. It's it's soft, right? Like, I don't throw that word around casually. I Like, I understand the CONCACAF Champions Cup hangovers is real. They have barely trained at all. Their only training sessions, more or less, have been walkthroughs because it's game travel, game travel recovery, walkthrough game. Rinse, repeat. I get it. That's very difficult. But they're not the only team doing this. In fact, they played Cincinnati this weekend, who also have CCC hangover. And Cincinnati rotated their squad heavily. Both teams were in the same boat. Since he had that dog in them, since he came back, they got better as the game went on. New England got worse. New England faded. Again, to empathize, it's not easy to navigate CONCACAF Champions Cup in the beginning of the season, particularly when you're taking over a new team. It's, it's at the point where they need to prove it. They are not getting the benefit of the doubt at this moment because Caleb Porter's last job with the Columbus crew, it was a lot like this. They led the league in, in points dropped from winning positions. They found new ways to almost comically give up points at the end of games. So this is more of a pattern. And like what I was saying with Dallas, there's much more evidence that this is a long-term thing and not just a random small sample size. You can only say something is unlucky so many times before you have to admit it's a pattern. I don't understand. Like, I'm not entirely sure how it gets fixed. I'm not entirely sure how we're here. Their best player, Carlos Hill, he is an absolute dog. And usually teams take the mentality identity of their best player. Under Bruce Arena, that was this team's best quality, was, was grinding out results on top of having special players. It's not like Bruce was doing something revolutionary tactically, and you don't need to. They were the best version of themselves, and they had a great mentality. I'm not sure what's going on. Their numbers back it up again, so I just don't sound like a oh, rub some dirt on it, mate, like try harder thing, because, you know, I get it. Like, that's boring if, you, if that's all you have. They've conceded. They're tied for worst in MLS with 10 goals against this year, and they're worst with a 9.58 expected goals against. They've played some tough, uh, a, a tough schedule. Yeah, again, all of this context matters. Small sample size. Teams go through bad ruts. But the underlying problems are not new. And it's a worry. All right, that'll do it for MLS 5 Aside Week 4. A little buyer seller action. This week, we've got a little power rankings update coming to you. Um, we'll have Episode 2 of the Football Manager MLS save. We'll see uh, if I can make the playoffs with my CFC after taking over midseason. Um, thank you all for checking in and continuing to watch through this uh, you know, boring little recap here. So, appreciate you guys. Talk to you soon.